In this afternoon's panel, the editors of the recently published book entitled Adaptive Peacekeeping, Peace, Peace Building, a new approach to sustaining peace in the 21st century will present the key findings from the book with a discussion of adaptive peace building approaches at its core. We believe the seminar is a great opportunity to consider pathways and challenges to sustaining peace in the 21st century. The presentation will be followed by a panel discussion with peace building experts and conclude with a Q&A session. To welcome us to this event, we'd like to call Professor Yoichi Mine, Executive Director of the JICA Ogata Research Institute, to give the opening remarks. Professor Mine, the floor is yours. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Yoichi Mine, uh, Executive Director of the JICA uh, Ogata Sadako Research Institute. Um, distinguished um, guests and panelists, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you for joining uh, today's uh, book launch uh, seminar on adaptive peace building. I'm especially honored to introduce uh, Professor Cedric de Koning. Um, from Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. Um, I really appreciate your taking an intellectual lead in organizing this project. Thank you so much. And traveling um, quite far away from the North Norway. Um, let's think of a big picture first. Um, we now face a broad range of the threats uh, to human security. Uh, such as climate change and the outbreaks of infectious diseases uh, like um, COVID-19 and flood and energy insecurities uh, triggered by the Russia's aggression against Ukraine, uh, the dark side of globalization, uh, the dangerous benefits of IT and AI development, and so forth. So among such threats, uh, the violent conflict is the uh, most uh, traditional, so to speak, uh, which is in, intensifies um, the fear among the large population. And unfortunately, uh, violent conflicts are still spreading, uh, becoming more protracted, uh, recurring, and even more complex. And contemporary wars uh, tend to be fought uh, within the state uh, rather than between the states. And because of the so state sovereignty, um, the international community finds it difficult to give support directly to the people who suffer in the boundaries of nation states. So, uh, responding um, the, to such responding to such challenges, uh, different views and approaches have been generated around the concepts and practice of peace building. In 2016, uh, the United Nations. Um, launched um, the Sustaining Peace Agenda, uh, which presented uh, a new narrative and approach uh, focusing on the long-term vision for inclusive peace, with peace building activities and in, in order to prevent and, and transform uh, violent uh, conflicts. Um, in addition, um, the Pathways for Peace, published by the World Bank and United Nations in 2018, a advocates uh, the need for uh, different actors to work together. Um, in light of these new trends and developments in the global debate on peace building, uh, JICA Ogata Institute launched uh, the research project um, titled uh, Contextualizing uh, International Cooperation for Sustaining Peace, uh, that's with subtitle Adaptive Peace Building Pathways. So uh, this adaptive uh, peace building assumes that any conflict is inherently complex and argues that sustaining peace requires context-based responses, uh, respecting people's resilience, um, participation, and ownership, uh, rather than imposing something from outside in a top-down way. So um, this point will be elaborated further uh, by the panelists today. Um, 
The research project has already produced, as I understand, uh, significant research outcomes in the form of two open access academic books. Uh, the first is Adaptive Mediation and Conflict Resolution, Peacemaking in Colombia, Mozambique, the Philippines, and Syria. And the second one, um, which we celebrate uh, in today's event, uh, is Adaptive Peace Building, a new approach to sustaining peace in the 21st century. Uh, this book uh, provides a comprehensive understanding of the theory and practice of adaptive peace building, uh, which is premised on the principle of local agency. Uh, Professor Cedric de Koning makes the uh, concept of adaptive peace building firmly anchored in the complexity theory. Okay. And the book comprises a theoretical exposition of the concept of adaptive peace building and the United Nations initiatives, and followed by the case studies of Colombia, Mozambique, uh, Palestine, Syria, and East Timor. Uh, combined with the peace building approaches of the two major Asian countries, uh, China and Japan. Okay. Um, just one week ago, um, the, in Hiroshima, uh, the G7 leaders uh, called on the international community to work together for peace, uh, prosperity, and stability. Uh, the adaptive peace building approach has the potential to contribute to addressing contemporary violent conflict and bring about a sustainable, sustaining peace. In today's seminar, um, the three editors, uh, Cedric and Rui-san and Muto-san, will explain the main messages of the uh, book. And the two panelists, uh, Murotani-san and uh, Kubota-san, uh, will uh, provide their inputs on, from the uh, practical and academic perspectives. So. We hope to have a lively exchange of ideas among all of us. So we welcome the questions from the floor and also the online. And um, if you have not downloaded the book, uh, I encourage you to do so after or even during the event. So the two books are the open access titles and downloadable from the Springer Palgrave website for free. Okay. So, Thank you so much for attending this event. Uh, let's begin. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mine, for your opening remarks. Now I'd like to introduce today's uh, presenters, the panelists. Actually, uh, Professor Mine has already <laughs> presented. But uh, at first, uh, Professor Cedric de Koning. Uh, professor De Koning uh, is a research professor in the research group on peace, conflict, and development at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. Uh, he has 30 years of experience in research, policy advice, training, and education in the area of conflict resolution, peacekeeping, peace building, and peace and conflict studies. Today, he traveled all the way from Oslo to join us in this seminar. Thank you, Dr. Dekon. Second, I'd like to introduce Dr. Luis Saraiva. Uh, Dr. Saraiva, uh, sorry, please turn on your camera. Sorry, I forgot to ask you to turn. Is it on? Okay, good. Uh, Dr. Saraiva is one of the co-editors of the book. He's a currently lecturer at Music International University and a visiting fellow here at the JICA Research, uh, JICA Ogata Research Institute. Until much of this year, he was a research fellow at our institute and was a part of our research uh, project. Uh, and he made a great contribution to publishing this book. We are glad that he can join us today uh, all the way from Miyazaki. Thank you, Dr. Sarabi. Next, uh, let me introduce Dr. Akomuto. Dr. Akomuto uh, uh, is uh, a specially appointed research fellow of the JICA Ogata Research Institute. She's also uh, the co-editor of the book and initiated the research project. We also have two panelists for the panel discussion. First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Yuichi Kubota. Uh, Dr. Pro, uh, Kubota is an associate professor at Nihon University 
and an expert on uh, quantitative approaches in conflict research. Dr. Kubuta, thank you very much for joining us in this seminar as a panelist today. And we also have uh, Mr. Ryuichi Murotani. Uh, he's the senior director and the head of office for peace building in JICA. He has a lot of uh, on field experiences in conflict countries. Now, let's move on to the presentations. We'd like to proceed with the book overview and theory of adaptive peace reading by Professor Cedric de Koning. I'd like to turn things over to him. Professor de Koning, uh, please turn your camera and microphone on. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Tony San and colleagues, uh, friends. Thank you so much for joining us for, for this uh, book launch event, both uh, here in person and online. Uh, it's, of course, as the editors of the book and contributors to the book, uh, a wonderful moment to have this opportunity to, to share uh, this book with you. Can we go to the next slide? So I will briefly introduce the book and, and also the concept of, of adaptive peace building. So firstly, to situate this book uh, in, in the larger context, um, we, we initiated this book project because we, we, we really uh, recognize the need to develop uh, new approaches to peace. Uh, both as a result of a changing conflict landscape, but also the larger context of changing global order, which uh, have had various influences on our ability to, to manage conflict. As we have seen, especially in a number of recent failures, uh, you know, maybe the most dramatic was the, the, the rapid withdrawal of the international community in Afghanistan, the fall of Kabul. But that has, I think, uh, also contributed to, to a growing awareness that in many other places where the international community is involved in conflict resolution and peace building, like the Democratic Republic of Congo and Mali, elsewhere, uh, our approaches to peace building is not working as well as it, as it used to work uh, a few decades before. And this has necessitated the need to revisit and rethink how we undertake peacekeeping and peace building. Next slide. So this is uh, led to the to the book project, um, and uh, especially our our larger focus around looking for a new alternative pathways to peace. Next slide. So. We developed the idea of adaptive peace building as one particular alternative approach to peace. And we've then tested the concept and ideas of the adaptive peace building in a number of case studies, eight case studies across Africa, Asia, the Middle East, and Latin America. Uh, we've looked at uh, five particular countries or peace processes. Uh, Colombia, Mozambique, Palestine, Syria, Timor-Leste. And we will present or share two, two of these case studies with you today, uh, the one on Mozambique and the one on Syria. And as you can see from these cases, those of you that are familiar with the, the broad peace field, you will see that these cases not only are geographically divergent, but they also provide us with a variety of different types of conflicts and also a broad range of different actors. So it's quite a wide variety of, of cases in which we are exploring the relevance of adaptive peace building. We were also in the interest of the changing global order, the, the, the rising uh, power of China. Uh, we were also interested to understand how do countries outside of the mainstream Western approach to, to peace, like China and Japan, how do they approach peace building and do they uh, have an adaptive dimension to their peace building approaches? So we have two chapters in the book that look at the role of China and Japan, 
and particularly the role of China in the South Sudan and the role of Japan in the context of the Philippines. So in that sense, two, two additional country cases as well that is introduced through, that, through those chapters. Overall, the book focuses on how Keith builders design and implement and evaluate a range of programs and initiatives to sustain peace. And we are especially interested in the relationship between external actors or the international community and national and local actors in the countries affected by conflict. And we are then, of course, focusing specifically in uh, into adaption as a coping mechanism for managing complexity and uncertainty in these different cases. Next slide. So our overall aim of the book was to explore if peace building approaches that are adaptive to context, like the adaptive peace building approach, whether those approaches are more effective at preventing and resolving conflict than approaches that are based on, on predetermined assumptions, predetermined outcomes. This would be liberal or illiberal approaches to peace. So the, it's essentially then a comparison of adaptive approaches to predetermined outcome driven approaches to peace. Next slide. And let me briefly summarize the main findings of the book based on uh, the various uh, case studies that we've looked at. We have found across these case studies, of course, in, in some cases more than in others, but overall, that top-down determined design and technocratic approaches were less effective than context-specific locally driven and adaptive approaches to managing and resolving conflict and sustaining peace. And it's interesting to see in many of these cases that there, there were you know, various peace processes over time, let's say over the last 30 years or so, that we could compare with each other. And we could see that some of those approaches were more top down and some were more bottom up, some were more context specific, and we could compare these with, with, with each other. And it was interesting to see that those context-specific approaches that were more effective were those that were deeply rooted in the history, cultures, and current reality, experienced reality of the people affected by conflict. Next slide. We also saw that the adaptive approaches that we identified in the case studies were more effective when they relied on the active engagement and participation of the affected communities. And we'll go into more detail here, but what we mean with active engagement is really not processes where communities are just consulted on ideas that come from elsewhere, but where communities are really actively engaged in uh, emergent solutions to, to the problems in the ways that they articulate themselves and understand themselves. And then lastly, we find that when people affected by conflict, uh, that when people affected by conflict uh, felt that they have been involved in shaping the peace, it also increased their sense of resp responsibility to sustain the institutions and processes necessary to sustain peace. So it generate co-ownership generate uh, identity with the peace processes and therefore a greater sense of, of ownership and responsibility to also sustain those peace processes. So this is why uh, this kind of approach is really key to generate self-sustainable peace. Because if we want to achieve self-sustainable peace, a peace where communities and societies themselves have developed the social institutions and the resilience necessary to manage their own disputes and tensions, uh, then you really need to do it in, in, in processes that closely involve those people in those solutions themselves. So these were the, the main uh, research findings uh, of, of the book. Next slide, please. 
So now I will introduce the concept of uh, adaptive peace building. Next slide. So peace building, let me start there, is how we understand peace building is that peace building is essentially about strengthening the resilience of the social institutions uh, of societies that are at risk of being affected by violent conflict. And we situate societies in a broader understanding of, of social ecological systems, recognizing that social systems and ecological systems are intricately interlinked, and that if we want to understand social systems, we have to understand them in their broader ecological context. And for peace to be self-sustainable, and you'll recognize that self-sustainability is kind of the key objective that we are aiming for in this approach, for peace to be self-sustainable, a society needs to have developed sufficiently strong national and local social institutions that can manage their disputes peacefully. And with social institutions, we mean both formal institutions like governments, uh, state departments, parliaments, uh, but also informal social institutions that we will typically identify with in the context of civil society or community uh, organizations or community uh, authorities and so forth. So the whole range of, of institutions that emerge in a society through which a society self-organizes. Next slide. And so resilience is a key concept for us in, in, in this regard, where resilience refers to the capacity of social institutions. So really their adaptive capacity, their social capital, uh, the capacity of social institutions to adapt and transform, to sustain their functions, structures, and identity under stress. So we recognize that societies, communities, could be under stress from a number of factors. It could be through violent conflict. Uh, it could be through climate change or, or other external or, or internal drivers of conflict. And resilience refers to then the capacity of those social institutions to manage those disrupting forces, those stresses, in such a way that their essential functions, structures, and identity are, are maintained or transformed and so our focus of peace building, our objective of peace building is then to help social ecological systems to prevent violent conflict by assisting them with developing these resilient social institutions that can manage and resolve emerging conflict before they turn violent. So that's the overall focus of, of peace building. And adaptive peace building then becomes a methodology about how how to bring this about. Next slide. So if I have to summarize adaptive peace building before I, I break it down into more detail, I would say it's a process where peace builders, and when we say peace builders, we mean both local, national, and international peace builders, where peace builders together with the societies, uh, communities, and people affected by conflict, so it's not something that just the peace builders do, but it's something that you do together with affected communities. And this is a very important dimension of adaptive peace building, that these peace builders and the societies together actively engage in a structured collaborative process to sustain peace and resolve conflicts by employing an inductive and iterative process of learning and adaptation. Now, that I recognize is quite a mouthful. But what we mean with that, first of all, is that it's a structured approach in the sense that there's a specific methodology that is consciously applied. It is collaborative in the sense that this is something that is emergent in, in, in collaboration with the communities and affected by conflict. And inductive refers to the fact that this engagement in the search and, and production of peace is something that comes not from a preconceived theory, but something that comes out of the experience of engaging 
in the context and with the people involved in the peace in in, in uh, developing this peace process and iterative refers to that this has to be a repetitive process it's not once off uh, it has to be ongoing because the context we are dealing with are continuously evolving and peace has to evolve together uh, with this process so the inductive process really focuses on learning and adaptation as two very strong dimensions of this process next slide please so the adaptive peace building approach is very much based on a understanding of the realities we're engaging with as ontologically complex in other words the reality we're dealing with is complex meaning that the situations are highly dynamic non-linear which implies that they are um, highly uncertain and unpredictable is the reality that we are we are dealing with and so by understanding this reality from a perspective of complexity theory we have a theoretical framework that can help us to to analyze and understand these these complex systems and this insights then help us when we study complex systems but also help us to understand how we can influence such complex systems but also what are some of the implications when we try to influence these systems so that we can uh, have a very good understanding of the ethical implications and the potential for harm that come about as a result of these processes as well let me go to the next slide so let me explain complexity a, a little bit more by comparing complicated and complex systems a complicated system is usually a mechanical system a closed system so we can think here of a watch or any kind of mechanism where the different elements in the mechanism have a very specified role and where the mechanism has a very specific function one way to think about this is to think of the kind of rockets we send to space to resupply the international space station or to bring people to the moon as as being planned now for for next year as well i mentioned rockets because we can understand that they are very complicated they require a lot of science uh, and many different disciplines to be integrated but they are complicated in the sense that once you have mastered that complexity in uh, uh, sorry not complexity but the once you've mastered the, the the design of that complicated system such as a rocket you can send a rocket to space and repeat it over and over again with a very high likelihood that the system will operate in the same way so it becomes predictable um, it can be repeated once you've mastered the design you can apply it in, in many different uh, forms you know when we when we talk about uh, complex things and social sciences we normally say it's not rocket science meaning that rocket science is much more complicated than what we are dealing with in social science but what i want to convince you of today is that when we talk about engaging with complex systems like social systems and trying to bring about peace it's actually much more complex than rocket science and this is because the systems we're dealing with the societies we're dealing with uh, the designs we we engage with when it comes to peace is not something that can become predictable and producible so when we for instance engage in a particular peace process i'm from south africa and in our transition away from apartheid we for instance uh, developed a particular process called the, Tr the truth and reconciliation commission which was a specific reconciliation tool that helped to uh, tell uh, reveal truth of what happened in various instances during the during the apartheid years and gave some some closure to that and that was seen as relatively successful in the south african context but although 
many people tried to replicate that in different contexts. It was really or never really as successful as it was in the South African case. And this shows you the irreproducibility of solutions in complex contexts, because those solutions are always context specific and emergent from the particular reality of, of uh, that situation. So this is what makes engaging with complex social systems and working on something like peace very different from dealing with an engineering problem. But our challenge is that in the past, very often we use engineering terms. We think of fixing failed states. We think of designing solutions as if the social dimension problems we're dealing with can be dealt with in the same mechanical way that we can deal with engineering problems. So the adaptive peace building approach really recognize the significant difference of the kind of situations we're dealing with when we try to bring about peace or also when we try to bring about development in, in societies. Next slide, please. So this uh, implication of complexity for undertaking peace building work really helps us to think about it in three different ways. First of all, it helps us think differently about how we understand or make sense of complex systems. It helps us understand that this unpredictability and uncertainty of the systems we're dealing with is not because we have lack of data or lack of analysis, but these are inherent characteristics of these systems. And that is why we need an adaptive, inductive approach to managing or understanding these, these systems. It's not possible to analyze them and understand them because they are continuously evolving. And therefore you need your, your understanding needs to evolve as well. Secondly, it helps us to understand how we try to influence complex social systems in order to achieve the peace building objectives I mentioned earlier. Um, it, it helps us to understand that when we try to intervene in any kind of complex system, that complex system will respond in a variety of ways. Some may be in the way we intended, but it's almost guaranteed that it will also respond in many other unintended ways. And we need to monitor that and be very, uh, we need to anticipate those kind of unintended consequences because some of them may also cause harm. And lastly, it helps us to understand how we need to act differently as actors who want to bring about peace. So how we plan, that we shouldn't plan in a very linear way, that we shouldn't expect a, a predictable cause and effect chain when we try to influence complex systems, but also how we evaluate and assess uh, the, the effects that we are trying to bring about. So I hope in broad terms that gave you a sense of, of uh, what adaptive peace building is. And uh, I think you'll get even more of an understanding when you hear the specific cases and how this is applied in, 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 in Mozambique and in Syria. So thank you very much. And back to you, Tony. Thank you, Professor De Koning, for your insightful presentation. Um, we now move to our next presentation by Dr. Sarah Iver. He will present the book's, uh, book's future and the case study of the Mozambican conflict, uh, which is one of the char uh, chapters of this book. We'd like to turn the floor over to him, but uh, may I ask as a panelist to turn off your camera, your screen? Thanks. Uh, over to you, Dr. Sraiva. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I'll, today I'll focus more on the case study of Mozambique. But before that, I'd like to express my gratitude to JICA and to the Research Institute for giving me this opportunity to share some words about adaptive peace building in Mozambique and also uh, a few words about this book that we, we have published in open access. And also, I'd like to extend uh, my greetings to all the panelists here and the discussants and it's really nice to see you here after the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, to have uh, this engagement here in, in the room. 
So in the next slide, I will start with a, a brief introduction about my chapter. And the reason why we have covered this case study in the book is because uh, sustaining peace was not achieved in Mozambique after more than 20 years of peace building programs. Uh, I don't know how much familiar you are with the current situation in Mozambique, but uh, before we had uh, a long civil war in the late 70s and also in the 80s. And maybe if you can move on into the next slide, uh, you will see some maps. But despite the peace agreement uh, in 1992, uh, peace was challenged uh, after exactly uh, 20 years uh, in 2012 with the resurgence of the civil war and also the emergence of a violent extremist insurgency that you might have heard in Cabo Delgado since uh, 2017. And uh, as I show in the map below, we also have additional human security risks that have emerged recently in Mozambique, uh, whether it's the impact of climate change or natural disasters, or infectious diseases such as cholera, malaria, and uh, also the COVID-19 pandemic in the last uh, three years. Um, and it's in this context that my chapter uh, explores adaptive peace building approaches in Mozambique. And I covered uh, the approach by the UN personal envoy of the Secretary, of the Secretary General in Mozambique, I covered the European Union, and but fundamentally I focused on what I called localized international NGOs, uh, which I'll explain later on. But I'll also like to take this opportunity to thank JICA uh, for uh, funding my field research in Mozambique. And as I mentioned here in the slide, my research methodology involved mainly qualitative methods and I did field work uh, in Mozambique. Uh, in the next slide, please. So uh, I already mentioned this, but uh, looking at the recent conflict cycles in Mozambique, we can highlight that in 2012, uh, a small scale conflict reoccurred between the Mozambican government, the Frelimo, and also Renamo, and that lasted until August 2019. And at the same time, in the northern province of Cabo Delgado, violent extremism emerged in 2017. And we have there an extremist insurgency that is still active today in the country. And the name of the insurgency is Al Shabaab, but the Mozambicans call it the Mashababus insurgency. This is, if you go to Mozambique, this is how people call that insurgency. And we also have. <clears throat> Sorry, we also had a splinter group from Renamo called the Renamo Military Junta, which did not agree with the terms of the new 2019 peace agreement, and they recurred to violence between 2019 and 2021. So this is just uh, to give you a very brief context of the idea of the peace and security challenges and the complexity of those challenges that Mozambique is uh, still facing today. In the next slide, please. Um, I might, uh, in the Q&A session, if someone is interested, I can try to elaborate more on the root causes of the conflict recurrence in Mozambique uh, later on. But I wanted to note that since the 1992 peace agreement, uh, the attempt was to create a multi-party democratic system in Mozambique influenced by this idea also of liberal peace building. But what we had as a reality on the ground was uh, the uh, constant or continuous recurrence of post-electoral violence. So the reality is that since the independence, Frelimo, Frelimo has always been the government. And the reality is also it functions now as a party state society. And that leaves the opposition, Renamo, continuously struggling and demanding for further decentralization and more power sharing in Mozambique. 
Another thing that happened is that the DDR process developed in 1992 was not successful. The Renamo fighters were not fully reintegrated into the society, and they decided in 2012 to recur to violence once again to express their political demands. So they still had arms. So this means in a way that what we call in the book the deterministic peace building or determined design peace building model or even liberal peace building model, uh, which was praised for almost 20 years in Mozambique, but actually the reality is that failed to maintain peace in the country. So I point out in my chapter that the current peace building trends that I observed on the ground in Mozambique highlighted that from now on these issues need to be addressed through a different lens. And that lens is the lens of pragmatism, of context specificity, and also uh, uh, national ownership and local ownership. And that means that maybe having external concepts, external ideas, external knowledge, external perceptions, and top-down mechanisms uh, within those peace building process, uh, it might not work in the current uh, 21st century. So the, the basic idea is that if we want peace to work, peace needs to emerge from within Mozambique. Next slide, please. Uh, so in first in my analysis, I identified that the turn, that turn from liberal peace building into adaptive peace emerged in the recent peace process, which involved three stages. Uh, the peace process, so I'm talking now about peacemaking or mediation. Uh, three stages. The first stage was about domestic mediation, the second stage about high-level international mediation, and the third stage, it was what we called in the book an adaptive mediation of the direct dialogue between the two leaders, the two Mozambican leaders. So the lead mediator of the adaptive stage of the peace process was the Swiss ambassador Mirko Manzoni, who employed uh, an adaptive and a pragmatic mediation style. His focus was on self-organization, these concepts that Cedric already mentioned, self-organization, national ownership, and uh, also trying not to bring the external interests of the mediators to the negotiation table. So actually this adaptive mediation approach in Mozambique, at least uh, until today, proved effective. And uh, it, it highlights this need that maybe in the 21st century, within the complexity that we have today, we do need a different approach to uh, mediation. And uh, actually in, in this analysis, I also focused on the mediator's mindset. And according to the adaptive practices, the, the mediator should embrace humility, should embrace acting with discretion and also focused on understanding the local context and offering local agency. I think this is also, uh, now I'm kind of uh, going out of my slide, but it, it resonates a lot also with the Japanese mindset, uh, at least from uh, uh, my understanding. But as you see in, the, uh, in this image that I put here, Actually, the ambassador Manzoni, he decided not to stay in the five-star hotels in the capital or in Maputo, but he traveled to the mountains in a motorcycle where uh, the Renamo had its own headquarters. So in my analysis, I argue that the process of adaptive mediation led to the emergence of more adaptive peace building programs since uh, 2019, when a new peace agreement was signed. Next slide, please. Uh, so after the 2019 peace agreement, uh, Mirko Manzoni went from being the lead mediator into being appointed the UN personal envoy of the Secretary General to Mozambique. And then he focused first on the implementation of new DDR programs, and uh, he's achieving also good results. Uh, there is an increased demobilization of the Renamo fighters. The, there, there is the closure of military bases and also a, a successful reintegration of most of the ex-combatants. 
And these programs actually also included special con considerations right now for female combat combatants. And the whole process was focused more on facilitation, not bringing external concepts, more on facilitation, national ownership, and adaptiveness. Um, I also looked at uh, the EU as uh, one of my case studies, and uh, I will just uh, briefly mention that the EU is also trying to change in my interviews with the EU delegation in Mozambique. I noticed that they are also trying to change their approach to peace building and incorporate elements of the a more adaptive approach or a more context specific approach. Actually, uh, when we look at the G19 or the group of the main uh, peace building partners in Mozambique, I got the feeling that these keywords as adaptation and context specificity, they are more used now, obviously, than uh, 20 years ago. So I feel that this adaptive turn is actually occurring, at least in Mozambique. Next slide, please. Uh, during my field work, I also found that in particular, local or what I call localized NGOs, they have been using successful adaptive peace building methods and practices in their activities. So I covered in my chapter, the examples of the community centered GDU and the Aga Khan Development Network uh, in Mozambique. Next slide, please. Uh, the first NGO I have examined is the Community Center GDU. And as you may know, they have the headquarters in Rome and some delegations all over the world. And they work both on peace building and humanitarian assistance. And its connection uh, with Mozambique comes from the 80s and actually from a friendship between a Mozambican bishop and Italian priests. So this friendship or a genuine human relation uh, led to actually years of humanitarian programs and also the successful mediation of the 1992 peace agreement. Uh, the, from that moment on, after 1992 or even during the 80s, since they went to Mozambique, the community center GDU decided to stay there forever. They say, we are not an external organization anymore. We are there to be, we will stay in Mozambique forever. And we want to work with the people living in vulnerable conditions. So what I'm saying here is that they focus also on uh, long-term objectives. And um, uh, now they have two main humanitarian projects. It's one is the Bravo project, and that is a birth re registration project to fight human trafficking, and also the Dream project, which is focused on fighting inf uh, infectious diseases in, in especially HIV and the COVID-19 during the pandemic. They also have been involved in reconstruction projects, the strengthening of education and health systems, and they developed the Youth for Peace movement in schools and universities in Mozambique. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> what I found on the ground is that the Community Center GDU, they employ a context specific and an adaptive approach in its peace building and humanitarian activities. They focus on local engagement, building strong relationships with the local population and also with the Mozambican government. And they fully rely on local staff. I, uh, this is a very important point because the effectiveness of their programs totally depend on the fact that they fully rely on local staff and not external staff. Uh, due to time constraints, I will uh, go into the next slide, please. So uh, the second uh, NGO that I have covered is the Aga Khan Development Network, which is a development organization founded by the Imam of the Shia Ismaili Muslims. They have many agencies in 30 countries and in Mozambique, they focus their activities in Cabo Delgado province, where the Mashababos or the Al Shabaab insurgency has been active since 2017, as I mentioned. They focus on food security, education, health, and humanitarian assistance. 
And uh, despite the challenges presented by such a complex environment affected by violent extremism, they also have the same recipe. They work almost 100% with local staff and they prioritize listening to the local community leaders and community agents. Next slide, please. So my question was also, how did the Aga Khan Development Network develop an adaptive approach? So they created this informal intermediary social institution called the Village Development Organizations, uh, the VDOs, and they focus through the videos on the promotion of self-organization, capacity building, financial literacy in Cabo Delgado. So what are the videos? They are in Cabo Delgado. They are the members are 10 to 20 people elected and representing the local communities, elected by the local communities. And in the videos, they will create the map of dreams, as you can see here in the pictures. And in the map of, of dreams, they are trying to clarify their optimal vision for their future and the future of their communities. So this map of dreams will define, it's through the map of dreams that the Aga Khan Development Network will provide assistance to that region, totally based on the local context. Uh, therefore, this is the main purpose of the village development organizations to serve the local vi villages and their citizens. But another factor is that they also function as reconciliation hubs. This is because the members, these members of uh, the videos, they belong to several ethnic and political groups. And moreover, also in the evaluation stage, the Aga Khan Development Network also is looking at the map of dreams and local feedback to assess their own uh, forms of support. Um, so in summary, I found that the Aga Khan Development Network, uh, is the, their programs are anchored in the context specificity, local agency, and all these uh, adaptive peace building principles that also Cedric has mentioned before. Next slide, please. And this is my final slide. Uh, so just as a point of view of uh, one of the book editors, I, I saw that not only in the case of Mozambique, but many of the case studies in our book, we are increasingly observing a peace building paradigm shift. Uh, whether this is triggered by domestic challenges or maybe the current geopolitical challenges that we are seeing around the world. So I think in all cases, this shift, paradigm shift is both a risk and also an opportunity. Uh, I think on the one hand, we have to be honest, there is the risk of complete failure of peace building. It actually might not work in this complex world that we have right now but on the other hand is also an opportunity it's an opportunity for actors like jica like the ngos etc to test new methods without forgetting their own values and new approaches to build peace uh, in the world today and I think that the, the book offers some value to the readers and gives a glimpse on the practice and theory of this new approach to sustaining peace. So in, in summary, I think adaptive peace building on one, in one hand, it emphasizes the importance, like I mentioned in Mozambique, of locally and nationally led peace building processes. This meaning, the, the meaning is also to encourage uh, a post-colonial view of peace building and also to encourage non-Western discourses. I think um, using the SPIVAX ter terminology, I feel that now if we use an adaptive approach, we are seeing subalt what were considered subaltern groups to participate they have now an opportunity to participate in peace building. And then, uh, as Cedric mentioned, 
Adaptive peace building also embraces complexity instead of creating this artificial, temporary, or an externally conceived order. So it means that it's encouraging peace builders to recognize the ongoing changes that we have today. Um, and that includes working with the various power dynamics in different societies, whether we like it or not, whether we like that it that country has a democratic regime or not. And finally, I saw it on the ground that uh, adaptive peace building facilitates peace to emerge from within by promoting uh, what Cedric also already mentioned, a self-sustainable peace process. And this means that, again, encouraging the self-organization of complex societies and empowering those affected by uh, conflicts to be active players in peace building. So just my final thought is that I believe that JICA and also other development agencies, they are also crucial actors to support the self-sustainable peace process processes. Thank you. Dr. Saraiva, thank you very much for your informative presentation. So let's now move on to the third presentation. Uh, our third speaker is Dr. Akomoto. Uh, she will present to us the implementation of, for international cooperation and the case of Syrian conflict. I'd like to turn the floor over to Dr. Mika. Thank you very much. Please turn on your camera. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Tuchia, for the introduction. My name is Mako Muto, and joining this research project. In fact, I'm working in JICA, and I've been an aid practitioner for more than 25 years. And since these several years, I've been engaged in research projects as a research fellow. So. Uh, maybe uh, my presentation is kind of a mixture of uh, research and, and implementation. And uh, the pre title of my presentation for today's seminar is also uh, the title of my chapter and also uh, the implication to the international cooperation. And so next, please. Next slide, please. Well, uh, my presentation is consists of five parts. First, I will explain the rationality of peace building approaches in the case of Syrian conflict. Then, uh, I'll show you some examples of externally driven and um, diverse locally driven approaches toward peace building. Next, please. Well, uh, peace building in case of Syrian conflict is considered as characterized by multiple externally driven initiatives linked to the opposition groups and their international backers. And from the middle of the conflict, uh, Syrian government took upper hand to the conflict with its backers. And then this uh, shift made the conflict more complex. Therefore, the Syrian conflict can be considered as an absence of a self-sustaining national peace process, and it's still stuck in the kind of peacemaking phase. So this means that Syrian conflict cannot move to kind of a peacekeeping or peacekeeping stage or post-conflict peace building stage. Therefore, in the case of Syrian conflict, adaptive peace building can be considered as an alternative approach, not kind of an alternative approach is to the successful uh, peace building, but to complement the sustaining peace agenda. Next, please. Uh, my chapter in the book, aims to answer the following two questions. What externally driven and adaptive approaches to peace building can be identified in the Syrian conflict? How have these two approaches worked and what have they achieved? Next, please. In this slide, I'm going to explain the international and regional context of the Syrian conflict. From its beginning, the international community was divided to support the Syrian government or not. The, uh, um, uh, among the permanent members of the United Nations Security Council, known as P5, the United States, United Kingdom, and France politically supported the opposition groups. However, one of the opposition groups they backed 
Syrian opposition coalition, uh, national, sorry, National Coalition for the Syrian Revolutionary and Opposition Forces, its abbreviation is SOC, had a weak domestic base in Syria, it's been based in Turkey, and could not unite the opposition group, said to be around thousands. On the contrary, the Russian approach respected Syrian sovereignty and accused the West of seeking regime change. Then, uh, among the countries concerned, uh, there are also regional uh, disputes among the countries which supports the government and the opposition groups. Iran, as is well known, strongly supports the government and the countries like Saudi Arabia or Qatar uh, backed uh, the opposition groups. Turkey's position is a bit complicated. In the beginning, it supports the opposition groups but has moved closer to, to Russia uh, since 2016. It, uh, Turkey, in fact, starting attack uh, the Syrian Democratic Forces and uh, when the Kurdish party, backed by the United States-led coalition, when it started expanding on its territory. And there's also another uh, opposition group backed by Turkey called Free Syrian Army. So you can see the various uh, actors in, in the international level, uh, regional level, and in the local level. Next, please. This slide shows that also the uh, complex context of the domestic, at the domestic level in the Syrian conflict. In fact, in 2011, influenced by so-called the Arab Spring, Syria entered into the conflict. In two years, uh, Syrian conflict is considered as a civil war. I mean, in the beginning, it started in the southern city of Syria, but the uh, conflict, small level of conflict expanded to the nationwide, and it became to considered as a civil war in 2012. It experienced tremendous rapid deterioration of humanitarian situation, up to 2013, and more than 4,000 ununited armed opposition groups came to fight each other. The Syrian government became weaker in the northern and southern areas, and the alternative administrative structure uh, were established in the area where the Syrian government withdrew. From such a situation, in 2014, what so-called the Islamic State of uh, Iraq and Levant, ISIL, emerged and declared a harifat. The international community agreed to fight against ISIL, but uh, they didn't agree how to uh, resonate, uh, how, to resol uh, how to resolve the conflict. Therefore, during those uh, periods, the Syrian government and the opposition groups uh, pragmatically participated in local and small scale ceasefire negotiation. This approach of the uh, small scale uh, ceasefire might be considered as kind of adaptive, uh, reflecting the complex conflict context. Upon the agreement in the international community to fight against ISIL, Russia in 2015 started airstrikes in Syrian territory. And it is said, to give upper hand to uh, the Syrian government dominantly in the conflict. Uh, in 2016, U United Nations initiated peace process has started, but as I mentioned, at this moment, the Syrian government had already dominancy in the conflict. Uh, so, well, and in, um, in 2017, uh, the series of dialogue, including both the Syrian government and to some extent the opposition group, uh, started, and it is called Astana Talk. It's backed by Russia, Turkey, and Iran. It is the Astana Talks is said to contribute to the government territorial recovery. In this context, the United Nations initiative resulted in the establishment of a constitutional committee in 2019. Parallelly, the international community continued the fight against ISIL and backed the Syrian Democratic Forces, SDF, 
the Kurdish main militia that mainly contributed to defeating ISIL. So the emergence of ISIL also made the Syrian conflict very complicated. Next slide, please. I can summarize the context of the Syrian conflict as follows. International and regional support are divided for supporting the government and the opposition groups. And there have been lack of, uni uh, lack of un uh, unification among the countries supporting the opposition groups. Power tensions among the countries concerned hindered Syrian domestic solution and prolonged the conflict. Then inside Syria, division among opposition groups existed. Further complexity was caused by the emergence of violent extremist group, which is an ISIL. Government, which have been taking the dominance in the conflict, lacks the strength to pacify the entire country uh, in its alone. It relies on militias, Russia, and Iran for assistance in regaining control. Next slide. Up to the previous slide, I explain the complex context of the conflict situation. From this slide, I will explain how the peace building approaches by external or actors were. Mediation efforts by international peace building actors, such as special envoys appointed by the United Nations, tried to be uh, tried to take adaptive approaches for uh, mediating the conflict. However, they were they have faced difficulties due to the complex and protracted nature of the conflict, as I explained. The United Nations and countries backing the opposition groups supported the establishment of a transitional government. However, it accompanied the delegation of the presidential authority, which the Syrian government rejected. It suggests that there are points of non-negotiation between the parties concerned. On the other hand, as I mentioned in the previous slide, there's uh, some adaptive approaches about the uh, small scale ceasefire have been taken. And those are supported by successive special envoys and international NGOs. Next slide. In addition to the mediation efforts, there were international responses. For the opposition held area, stabilization assistance to build new governance structure for a transitional government was provided. This assistance was provided to the alternative administrative structure after the Syrian government withdrew. However, reflecting the complex conflict situation, the, the community in the opposition held area preferred or welcomed more humanitarian assistance, which accompanied uh, the stabilization assistance much more. Also, uh, as I explained in the previous slide, a series of Astana talks was initiated by Russia and Turkey with Iran. It involved the Syrian government and a more inclusive range of armed opposition groups and achieving face-to-face -face negotiation between the parties. It is said to support the adoption of local ceasefire promoted by the government and territorial recapture. And it is said also to contribute to the reduction of violence and causalities. So pragmatically, their approach was kind of an effective to reduce the uh, tension of violence. However, the government or the Astana talks approach uh, is criticized to some by some scholars as a surrender to the government. Next slide. This slide summarizes uh, the uh, divergent peace building approaches. The United Nations and the countries backing the opposition groups supported the formation of a transitional government. In the opposition group held areas, the assistance to promote a new governance structure with liberal value was not always prioritized, then uh, humanitarian assistance were more welcome. Pragmatic responses by Russia and other supporters of the Syrian government have worked to the government's advantage and contributed to reducing violence and causality, but it's criticized as a surrender to the government. So, influenced by those externally driven approaches, United Nations mediation was largely affected by such externally driven approaches, although special envoys attempted, attempted to implement uh, kind of adaptive approaches to, to compromise the both parties. So therefore, 
uh, the reconstruction of the kind of pre-conflict government system, which now the Syrian government is trying to recapturing, has been gradual but fragile, influenced by such international tensions. Next slide. So I would say that um, this moment, uh, externally driven approaches uh, to some extent may be effective. However, it could not reach uh, the nationwide uh, overall peace agreement. Under these circumstances, now I'd like to explain uh, two example of the programs, which is considered as a locally driven approaches. First one is, uh, Civil Society Support Room, its abbreviation is CSSR. It is established in 2016 under the leadership of special, uh, third, third Special Envoy, Mr. Demistura. It invited Syrian citizens, regardless of where they were based or their affiliations. It allows for the input of civil society knowledge into the peace process, reflecting the views and needs of citizens. It promotes also dialogue, and it served as a forum for exchanging ideas among Syrians divided by the conflict. The CSSR had such function, and it could foster a network of Syrians that contribute to self-organization and building trust within the conflict context. So we can say that the adaptive approach of the CSSR aimed to address these challenges by providing a contextualized and localized space for discussion, fostering understanding and bridging differences of opinion. Next, please. Another program locally driven uh, is the National Agenda for the Future of Syria. Uh, its abbreviation is NAFS program. It was established by United Nations in 2012 as a response to the Syrian conflict with the aim of preparing for post-conflict state building. It emerged from the need for an agenda driven by Syrians themselves, regardless of where they were based, reflecting their internal aspiration, not to let their countries divided. Nafs analyzed the damages conflict at the present situation, but utilized various methods in data collection using their network inside country, and they conducted impact evaluation of the conflict. Based on such data, they produced or prepared a policy alternatives, preparing for uh, the day zero, uh, I mean, the, the, the conflict. And it served, also served as a platform for technical dialogue and discussion. NAFS contributed also to fostering a better understanding of each other and created a space for a di uh, divided civil society where participation participants listened and understood differing opinions so that they could build trust and respect. The NAFS program is not political in nature, but serves as a practical or technical tool for active peace building. And it also has the character of contextualized, localized and self-organizing with minimal foreign technical guidance Allow, and this allowed Syria to take ownership of the analysis and policy development. Next slide, please. The two program had the challenges. Uh, in case of CSSR, uh, both the opposition groups and the government perception had that perception that it didn't represent civil society on their side. And uh, well, and. Uh, uh, in a protracted conflict situation, uh, this is also affected uh, the smooth discussion among the participants, and sometimes the presence of non-civic actors uh, affected the discussion flow in CSSR. Next slide, please. In case of NAFS, uh, in fact, they prepared for the policy alternative for the post-conflict phase, however, uh, the conflict prolonged more than their expectation. Therefore, uh, the policy framework they uh, prepared, uh, how can I say, uh, could not uh, serve yet because uh, now uh, still the conflict is ongoing. Therefore, they had to continue their focus on current, present, uh, current situations analysis and damage assessment. 
So they have the feeling that until when they have to continue this, and also they want to contribute more directly to support or the recovery of the uh, country inside. Next, please. However, in summary, the both two programs are considered as examples of adaptive uh, peace building. And both programs have challenges, but despite those challenges, both programs are considered as a part of holistic system and remain adaptive to the context of the ongoing context and a very programmatic approach driven by uh, local initiatives. Next, please. As a, con uh, as a conclusion, um, externally driven peace building approaches in the Syrian conflict have not resulted in a comprehensive peace agreement among the parties involved. Adaptive peace building approaches that respect the ownership of local people and promote their agenda shows potential. The two initiatives are considered as examples of adaptive approaches that have stimulated dialogue and built networks and trust among participants. Resuming dialogue and promoting adaptive approaches can be effective in protracted conflict, even without the entire ceasefire agreement. Concerted efforts by external actors are needed to promote adaptive approaches and engage diverse local actors to reduce violence and improve peace conditions in the complex Syrian conflict. Next, please. And I would say that uh, this kind of adaptive approach, uh, considering the context, quite resonates with other types of international cooperation. In this research project, we may have taken the uh, most difficult uh, situation, I mean the protracted and recurrent conflict cases, where the adaptive approach might have faced uh, difficulty. So uh, different from Dr. Saraiba's example, Syrian case may not reach, may have not reached uh, to the entire peace agreement. However, I hope I could show uh, some examples of uh, potential adaptive approaches which resonates, uh, which can, uh, can supplement uh, the overall uh, peace process. And also uh, I would say that uh, this process quite resonates with uh, the JICA's development assistance uh, in the daily basis and also other type of international cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mito, for your valuable uh, presentation. And so now let's move on to the, our next agenda as we finish the three or all three presentations. So the panel discussion will be about adaptive peace building possibilities in theory and practice. Uh, Dr. Mito will moderate this part of the pro program. Uh, Dr. Mito. Uh, over to you. Okay, thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Tsuchiya. So uh, let's start uh, the panel discussion. First, we will have the two presentations from the panelists. Then we will uh, discuss the possibility of adaptive peace building in theory and practice among the three editors and the two panelists up to around five, uh, well, I hope we are on time, around 5.40 if possible, uh, or, or maybe uh, 5.40 or 5.50 or something like that. And then uh, we will receive the question from the floor. So first, uh, the first presenter uh, from the panelists is uh, Dr. Uh, Kubota. So it's, uh, the floor is yours. Please turn on your camera on and microphone. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, um, Muto-san. And uh, uh, first of all, I, I'd, I'd just like to congratulate uh, the authors and the JICA Research Institute on the publication of uh, this great book. I think uh, the editors uh, uh, did a great job to put together very interesting case studies and uh, theoretical arguments on uh, adaptive peace building. So um, in this brief discussion, I'd just like to make some comments on theoretical and pr practical issues of uh, adaptive peace building. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I understand that uh, the main framework of this book is a kind of a theoretical um, uh, contrast between adaptive and the determined designed uh, peace building. And uh, I think the comparative advantages of adaptive peace building are very well discussed 
uh, in the book. Uh, but at, at the same time, uh, we probably need to take a look at some obstacles uh, when we want to promote adaptive peace building more. Uh, for example, in terms of uh, the cost and time, fr uh, time frame, uh, some people uh, will believe that adaptive peace building is much uh, uh, costlier and uh, takes time, time consuming than uh, the determined design peace building. We actually had a, a discussion uh, yesterday and what uh, Cedric said is um, adaptive peace building is not always uh, slow and doesn't, uh, doesn't always take time, uh, longer time than uh, determined design peace building. But still uh, some readers and uh, people uh, may believe that adaptive peace building is uh, very costly and um, uh, very slow. And that would be one of the obstacles to for the promotion of adaptive peace building. And also for uh, human resources uh, development, I think whether uh, adaptive peace building can be successful or not just depends on the personal abilities and uh, artisanship of uh, local peace, builder, uh, peace builders. Uh, this is because we need a very uh, delicate balance between external intervention and local self-help for uh, sustaining peace. So I, I think that uh, we are probably uh, seeking for completely different types of competency than uh, the, the administrative and the financial knowledge and skills that were that have been very useful uh, uh, when uh, during determined design peace building uh, programs. And um, another obstacle uh, for the promotion of adaptive peace building would be in the current uh, uh, confrontation in the international regions within and outside of the UN, such as uh, the, the confrontation between the US and China or Russia. One, of, uh, one side of, of uh, those parties uh, tend to put emphasis on uh, liberal, uh, liberalism uh, in the political and economic system, but the, the others uh, doesn't. So in, in such a situation, those who um, support liberal ideas wouldn't abandon uh, their uh, ideas, even for uh, peace building, the implementation of, of peace building. So I feel that uh, the ideological confrontation became just became more salient and it would have some impact upon uh, the peace building, how, how we think about the peace building. And so next slide, please. And for uh, the implementation of adaptive peace building, uh, I think a couple of questions are very useful to think about how we uh, carry out uh, the pro programs on the ground. First, um, I just wonder if uh, spoilers who benefit from the continuation of conflict should be in excluded or included in the peace building processes. I assume that basically uh, those spoilers tend to be excluded uh, in the determined design uh, peace building programs. Otherwise, they just uh, um, ruin the, the efforts for uh, peace building. But uh, the, the, those spoilers are still a, a, a part of and the members of the local stakeholders. Uh, so in the principles of adaptive peace building, uh, I feel that they should be included, uh, they still uh, should be included in the, the process of, of uh, peace building. And also secondly, uh, can we really abandon the underperforming uh, initiatives and programs, even if they are relevant to uh, local context? And uh, also relatedly, uh, how can we really know what initiatives and programs should be abandoned if there's no single path uh, to sustaining peace? Okay. We may have some uh, programs that are not uh, working very well for now, 
but they may uh, be working uh, well in the future. So I, I'm asking this question because we often say that after a storm comes a calm or a good comes out of evil. So we don't really know uh, what uh, programs would be working in the future. And the third one is uh, kind of a, a commonly asked uh, question for the local town thesis of uh, peace building, which is that the respect for local power balance may uh, further uh, marginalize ordinary citizens and uh, may preserve socio-political con uh, conditions and relations that have caused armed conflict before. So uh, I'm just interested in how you will uh, respond to uh, these questions and uh, uh, criticisms. And next, next slide, please. And uh, lastly, I'd like to uh, discuss some uh, research agendas that you would, would have in the future. The book spent uh, many pages uh, to discuss the effectiveness of adaptive peace building. Uh, but I feel that it doesn't talk much about what makes adaptive peace building actually happen. So in order for us to answer uh, this kind of question, uh, we probably need, need to uh, look at more uh, diverse cases of armed conflict and uh, peace building efforts. Of course, uh, the cases that are examined in the book uh, represent well the, the armed conflict in each um, region, uh, but uh, we, uh, I think that we are, uh, we need to look at more uh, cases uh, to answer this question by avoiding uh, selection bias. And also um, country level analysis uh, may not be very appropriate uh, if the context of armed conflict and conflict aff affected societies differ from region to uh, region. And of course, uh, some chapters uh, just took uh, the subnational level analysis and a subnational level case studies. So uh, that would be uh, the, the appropriate uh, approach uh, to study uh, uh, the adaptive peace building in detail. And also, I would say that a large end approach would, would be useful. Uh, to uh, to give some answers to this question, and but I, I think I also think that one of the difficulties here is that uh, we probably need to have a very clear and single uh, definition or measurement of uh, adaptive peace building uh, that is uh, applicable across uh, the cases. But uh, as I just said, and the books uh, as the book uh, argues the context of armed conflict and peace building differ from region to region. It, uh, this, is, this would be a tough uh, uh, to, to have a very single uh, definition of adaptive peace building. So uh, anyway, uh, these are all for my comments and I, I would appreciate any of your feedback. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kubota for your really insightful uh, inputs. So please turn off your camera. And now uh, we will have uh, Mr. Murotani, the second presenter, uh, for your input and comments. So Murotani, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Murotani. Uh, uh, I, I would also like to first congratulate uh, Cedric uh, Rui-san and Murotani uh, for the publication of this new book. And I am very honored uh, to be a part of this uh, book launch event. And I found this uh, book very inspiring. Uh, with rich uh, case studies and the i think many of us now accept that uh, peace building is uh, not an easy task there's no cookie cutter easy solutions but i think the book uh, by use uh, by using the term adaptive and complexity theory uh facing really with the complexity uh, the challenges uh, of this uh, uh, difficult uh, task of uh, building uh, peace. So I would first like to uh, make a quick uh, comment, uh, two comments, and then uh, I'd like to uh, share 
how uh, JICA is operationalizing the idea of adaptiveness uh, to our uh, efforts for the peace building. My uh, first comment is that uh, listening to the presentations, I found uh, uh, this concept of adaptive peace building is very, very convincing, while uh, on the other hand, it's very broad and flexible. So it might be easier for us to understand uh, what is not adaptive peace building than what is adaptive peace building. So that's my first comment. And secondly, uh, listening to your presentation, there are many different uh, conditions and the ways of engagement uh, in this adaptive peace building. So it might be um, um, of our interest as you as, as well as your interest, if you can uh, give us some ideas on what would be the uh, factors or environments, conditions that allows adaptive peace building for success. So what would be, be the conditions or uh, uh, environment that will increase the probability of success for the adaptive peace building? So that's uh, my uh, first two comments. And, uh, and, and on our uh, practical side, I would like to just to say that uh, JICA's uh, ways or JICA's um, operations for the peace building is very much resonating with what you have already described as an, a concept of adaptive uh, peace building. So I have uh, in my on the on the screen I am uh, showing the what we call the JICA's global agenda uh, for peace building, which is a, a institutional uh, strategy uh, for achieving the uh, peace building as JICA. And I put this uh, building uh, peaceful and just societies. And I say, and I say, the building resilient states and societies that can prevent uh, the violent conflict as our aim of the global agenda, which is very similar to what uh, Cedric just mentioned of as a a, a objective of adaptive uh, peace building. And by the way, for those of you who are present physically here, we have just uh, uh, distributed. Uh, uh, a uh, uh, very short uh, brochure of this uh, global agenda, and it's on, also on the, on our website. I just uh, searched for the word "adapt" uh, in the in the document, and unfortunately, it it only appears twice. But uh, it's interesting. The first one uh, appears as an explanation of Japan's own experience of state building after the Meiji Restoration, and that is somehow uh, as as a kind of a, the adapt adaptation to the international rule of law and the modern uh, state institutions. So that's one. And the secondly, based on that, uh, our own experiences, we are trying to apply uh, adaptive uh, approaches to our own efforts uh, for the peace building in the fragile and conflict affected countries. So I have, I, I, I would like to go through the uh, slides and next slide, please. And in this document, we have put uh, three uh, key approaches. And the first one uh, is this one, uh, that we, we would put the human security principles as our uh, guiding principle for the peace building. And in, in, in our peace building, uh, human, human security principles, it is a multi-sectoral comprehensive approach. So the peace building idea uh, would step across uh, different sectors and mobilize different uh, sectoral activities. And next slide, please. And secondly, I, I we see how we, we I put how we build the resilient states and societies. So we need to put we need to build a strong uh, capacity of the government to deliver uh, functional and inclusive and responsible uh, public services that will lead to the recognition of the legitimacy of the state from the people. So it's a kind of a trust building uh, between the government and the people. And, and then there is another element of empowerment, uh, empowerment of societies, so that the society will be socially cohesive, as well as uh, empowered to deal with uh, different types of uh, shocks. And next slide, please. And we also put another uh, element of our uh, operation uh, principle as a humanitarian development peace nexus. 
Uh, can we go to the next slide? Uh, so this so this is a, a kind of an uh, advocate uh, from us that we would like to reach out to various uh, partners, including the humanitarian agencies and the peace actors, including the UN peacekeeping missions or uh, diplomacy and security actors, so that we can uh, collectively work towards the peace building. Next slide, please. So as I uh, described how we see our uh, cooperation strategies for the peace building, I just wanted to uh, compare what is written in the book. So I picked up some keywords from the book about the adaptive peace building. So I might be uh, wrongly picking up some words, but uh, I am hoping that this, this uh, demonstrates this, the, the uh, essence of the uh, adaptive peace building. While on the right hand side, I put the uh, what we what I what we believe an important uh, guiding principles from our human security principles. And you you can see that these uh, two columns uh, are similar to each other. We both value they they both value the con con context specificity and the participation homegrown solutions, locally owned and locally led uh, um, initiatives. The two terms on the bottom right, agency and solidarity, are the two keywords highlighted in the UNDP's uh, new report on the new uh, generation of the human security uh, recently published. And the, I would say these agency and solidarities are introduced, but I would say it's a kind of a re-emphasized by the, by, by the new report. And the agency uh, valuing the uh, people uh, in the local communities as an agent for change, that's something we very much value uh, in the human security people-centered approach. And that's something I heard uh, from Cedric's presentation, as well as uh, Ruizan's and the Mutosan's presentations. So I think uh, they, these two approaches are resonating with each other. So that's why I took this adaptive peace building as a very um, uh, familiar uh, concept uh, to us. And in the book, uh, you can find a chapter uh, dedicated for the Japan's engagement in the Mindanao peace process, which describes how we are uh, applying this adaptive approach to our in endeavor in the uh, Mindanao peace process in the Philippines. Next slide, please. So uh, I would say, the importance or the validity of this adaptive peace building is very much shared amongst the JICA uh, staff as well as um, broader uh, development uh, communities. But at, at the same time, I see difficulties in operationalizing it. And, uh, and I think that the challenge here is not only about the adaptive peace building, but it's a challenge for uh, bureaucratic uh, bureaucracy, including JICA and other uh, development or humanitarian or peace actors, to to address the complex challenges because this the the, the complex challenges are giving us a lot of questions, which are not something um, um, compatible to some of the bureaucratic uh, rules and regulations. So I put three uh, challenges, and I am hoping that we can improve uh, these mechanisms so that we can apply more effective adaptive effective adaptive uh, approach in the future. First one is adapting to the uh, changing local context. I think we are hearing a lot of times how uh, actors are trying to uh, update ourselves and changing our behaviors so that to adapt the changing local environment. And changing means mobilizing different sectors. So it's a, it's not. I mean, in some in some cases, we may need to uh, mobilize a new sectoral experts uh, in our uh, development endeavor, and and that needs uh, some flexibility in our uh, operations and respect for the ownership. That's a very important principle we value, but at the same time, it's very very uh, difficult in, in on the ground. Yesterday we were chatting about uh, um, um, and, and, and story uh, from my uh, uh, conversations with the World Bank colleagues some ten years ago in Indonesia, where they were implementing the community-driven development uh, programs, 
and uh, they were letting the community development councils, the local uh, communities themselves, to decide the how to use their allocated block land from the World Bank. And some local communities have chosen uh, building the pagodas rather than schools or health clinics. And the, the, the bank was very, how, how would I, I would say, uh, how, the bank staff was very um, worried or concerned uh, whether to go ahead with funding the uh, pagoda building. But, uh, but, but they, they, uh, in that case, they, they, they went ahead with funding the uh, building of the pagodas. And that was the, the extreme uh, extent uh, to which the bank tried to respect the ownership of the local communities. And whether we can do that uh, for our other engagement, that's, uh, I think, the challenge we are facing. Monitoring and evaluation. Uh, first of all, this uh, monitoring mechanisms, we need to create a better monitoring system so that we can update ourselves uh, more often, so that we can, what we call the, this plan do, plan do check action PDCA cycle, how we can uh, uh, rotate this, uh, PDC, this cycle uh, more uh, quickly or more frequently, that's, uh, that's the challenge, and how we can uh, properly grasp what's going on on the ground and uh, and make it and and and, uh, and feed it back to our uh, operations. The result management on the on the side of the evaluation, and it's a tradition of having a predetermined targets and compare the impact of, and an actual impact of development engagement with the predetermined targets. So that's some um, traditional result uh, management and how we can adapt our result management mechanisms to this adaptive approach. Uh, that's another uh, challenge, I would say. And finally, the coordination. Uh, I think we would be uh, happy if you could uh, advocate for this adaptive approach, so that more and more uh, partners would apply these uh, adaptive uh, approaches. But I think it's the peace building is a collective effort. So uh, we need to have more uh, partners or alliance to be uh, flexible and, 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 and adaptive and, and respect the uh, locally driven uh, mechanisms so that we can uh, collectively support the uh, locally led uh, peace building initiatives. That's all from my side. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Murotani, and also Dr. Kubota, for your comprehensive and very um, simultaneous uh, stimulating input. So now uh, we will enter into the Q and A at all. Uh, I was thinking to make a panel discussion, so I was thinking to to let the uh, editors reply to the inputs. However, unfortunately, we have only fifteen minutes left. Therefore, I think it's good to enter into the Q and A session, and as a as a as a whole. Uh, three editor will uh, reply, including the input from Rotani san and Dr. Kubota. And luckily, we have received the prayer uh, question. I mean, the, some of the participants, when they registered, raised some question. And a few of them are about uh, what is adaptive peace building or what is new in adaptive peace building. And we hope uh, our presentation could reply to those questions. And one question I think is valuable to raise, and I will read it. In the context of South Sudan conflict, how Will we uh, how will how will we engage new approaches of sustainable peace to resolve conflict episodes in the young country? So this I will, I'd like to take as a first question. And uh, if uh, the participants in this uh, venue, if you have any question, please raise your hands. Yes, please. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Yeah. Good afternoon yeah. to all. And thank you for the organizer to give me a chance to be here. My name is Shukuhi. I am by country, I'm from Iran, and by profession, I'm in agriculture and environmental conservation field. Uh, thank you for explanation. Uh, quickly, I go to Syrian case. Syrian case, when it started, uh, first Western country show some interest and got involved. But gradually, they lost their confidence. And they say, this has no military solution and left the area without saying, what is the solution? Without 
bring it up uh, another option and left it to Iran and Syria, and they did it militarily. That, after that, Putin started taking of Ukraine, Ukraine. So uh, it was the lack of political willingness of Western countries to remain and be engaged in Syria and do it peacefully and non-militarily by just saying is no military option and without saying any option. So uh, thank you, sorry for taking a long time. Uh, my question is that what, you, how weight you give to political willingness in peace building? Even the people at low level, they will to do, if there is not a political willingness, as we saw in the Syria, in upper case, in the government level, at higher international level, how the, your adaptivity peace building will work. Thank you for attention and sorry for taking a long time. Thank you very much for your great question. Okay, so we'll collect some questions and then uh, we'll make an overall replies. So then, yes. So, yeah. So, at the first uh, lady in the front, and then we'll move on to the uh, gentleman in kimono, and then we'll move on to the uh, gentleman in the uh, uh, black suits. Okay, so microphone, please. Uh, nice to see you again, professors and the presenters. Thank you so much for uh, informative presentation. I have three questions. Sorry, would you, I'm very sorry. Uh, would, quest, uh, would you say your name and your affiliation, then okay. please start your question. Thank okay, you. my name is Yuhi Yamano. I'm a master degree student from Hitotsubashi University, which is located in Kunitachi city in Tokyo. Uh, I have three questions to, the first question is, uh, for the overall content uh, for this like book and the presentation. And the second point is uh, picked up uh, from the uh, Professor Lu San. And then the, the third question is um, for, I think for uh, Muto San. The first question is um, to, uh, the, regarding the like, adaptive peace building as a like local or like embracing peace building process. And I just curious one in uh, the question of to what uh, extent, like to what local extent, like does it need to uh, go down and to include, so for example, local government or like local community or uh, the leader of one village. And uh, are these detail of the uh, like including the local or like participants in peace building process is serialized or um, if not, should it be uh, determined by adaptive approach to the specific area? And also the second question is um, for uh, Professor Louis San. So are uh, you raised to cases of internationalized local NGOs? And, uh, but you closed uh, your presentation with uh, mentioning the uh, JICA as a uh, uh, promising actor. Um, so localized international NGOs and official development assistance agencies, for example, like JICA. So do you think these two can be the same level of contribution or, or like these are compatible? Or like, do you think each one of them have much advantages over the other? Um, in, for example, in like including the uh, local participants so, or just communicating with the local um, like level of like part, um, participants for peace building process. And the third question is uh, for Muto-san. Um, so you mentioned that the uh, dialogue and uh, uh, making dialogue and the build, uh, building net networks and trust uh, is very important. And I was wondering, um, why if, uh, if participants uh, in the peace process hate to have dialogue based on, for example, based on their antipathy towards the libel, their libel, how does adaptive peace building pro process or policies take measurement to uh, the antipathy to have dialogue? And uh, regarding the trust, 
uh, to make trust in post-conflict zone, uh, there is need to have justice, I think, justice among each rivals. So, I mean, uh, like transitional justice. And uh, in some cases, uh, some judicial measurement to accept the fault of uh, each size is needed. So the order of adaptive peace building would be establishing transitional justice and then talk for uh, adaptive peace building process. Uh, and then if so, the adaptive peace building uh, policies uh, cannot be launched by, uh, uh, sorry, until transitional justice established. Isn't it, I feel like, isn't it causing stack of peace building process, the launch of uh, peace building process itself? So next uh, stage from humanitarian to the development peace building uh, is uh, going to be delayed. So do you think it's the measurement to take it? Thank you very much for your rich questions. Then uh, to... Thank you very much. My name is Yuji Wesugi, working for Waseda University. I have some conceptual questions. I have been exploring what are the main differences between local peace building and adaptive peace building? And today, by listening to three uh, presentations, I seem to reach a conclusion that uh, local peace building only focusing on local context. While it seems like this adaptive peace building is more systematic approach, but not only the local context, but also the regional context and the global context. So all these contextual factors that can constitute the system as a whole, it, so you need to be adaptive to not only just the low, very local, but also global regional thing. And if uh, my understanding is correct, I think this is the major distinctive element uh, of the adaptive approach uh, from the local approach. And I was wondering if my understanding uh, resonate with your understanding. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Then, uh, yes. Good evening. Thank you for your great presentations. My name is Kazushige Kobayashi, and I'm associate professor at Wismaker University. I have a question similar to Professor Wesugi, and my question is, to what extent uh, does the global structure of geopolitics affect the dynamics of uh, adaptive Peace building. I think, especially in the case of Syria, I think maybe like 70, 80 percent of variations what is happening on the ground may appears to be uh, to me it seems that it is related to geopolitics. Uh, for example, in 2015, 16, Russia intervenes. Everything changes. In that case, don't we think like don't you need to think about uh, as Professor Wesley mentioned the global context first? Maybe do you think there can be something like a global peace building? I think that unless we solve the problem that is happening at the global stage, we cannot really try to meaningfully influence local dynamics. I think that is very intricately connected to 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 what is happening in the globe. And uh, yeah, that's a question. Thank you. Thank you very much for rich, rich questions. Uh, we can start from Cedric. Thank you so much for, for engaging with uh, these concepts and, and for your questions. I appreciate it very much. Uh, Kazu, I think uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, there are, of course, many external exogenous factors that need to be taken into account. And I think that, in a sense, the context determines which system you are dealing with at what level. But whichever level it is, uh, the, the principle tells us you have to engage the various stakeholders. You know, so even if it's something more global, external, there are a set of stakeholders that you have to take into account. And I think that resonates very much to, to Yuji's uh, question as well uh, about the, uh, the, the difference and the, the recognition that there's a broader set of contextual factors at play. I think absolutely, I, I agree with you. Thank you very much for that, for that insight. And uh, Wodo-san, thank you so much for, for all your comments uh, that you really reflected on it. I think many of the uh, questions you raise are are um, challenges with peace building, all different approaches to peace building, you know, have focus and, and challenges on those sides. But maybe one or two things specific. I, I really liked your idea of focusing on competencies. What different competencies do you would you need in 
or adaptive peace building. That's a very interesting uh, contribution. I agree with you on spoilers. I think generally spoilers need to be included. I'm very influenced by President Nelson Mandela, who in his own peace process has always said that everybody who's able to disrupt the process should be engaged. Otherwise, if you ignore them, they will disrupt the process and, and, and you, your, your process will not uh, go very far. Um, and then maybe uh, Murutani's son on, 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 I think your question about what factors or conditions can influence adaptive peace building is really a very interesting one. I don't have enough time now to go into detail. I think uh, that's a, a good challenge that, that we need to work on and expand. I'll just quickly say that uh, there's a scholar called Donella Meadows who looked at the what factors uh, to influence when you want to influence complex systems. And she said that the, you know, typically we spend a lot of time on things that are very low leverage, but the highest leverage things we need to influence are, are the paradigm, the mindset. Um, I think that that resonates very much with this concept as well. And and another next level of, of highest uh, influence levels are things like structures and goals in systems, right? If you change those, the whole system will change. But the highest order element to influence complex systems, she said, is our own paradigm. First, we need to understand our own paradigm before we even look at the paradigm of the situation we want to influence to understand what limits maybe we have or frames we apply when we try to solve these problems. And I think the, the kind of recognition of agency, the recognition of, of solidarity, uh, of complexity, these are some of our own paradigms which help us to, to, to approach a situation in different ways. But I'll just stop there because of interest of time. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, comments by the discussions and the Q&A. Um, where should I start? I think uh, the, the comment uh, by Professor Kubota on costs and time frame. I'm going to speak from the case study of uh, Mozambique. I think some of these uh, cases that I covered, they start with small programs, but ad adaptive programs and not expecting immediate results. So more focused on the long term. Also, again, the point that you raised very important about the uh, human resources. I went to Mozambique last November for another research project, more focused on uh, Cabo Delgado. And most of the local experts mentioned that usually when they sponsor uh, peace peace building programs, they tend to hire the human resources from the capital to go to Cabo Delgado and uh, work on those programs there. And often that doesn't work because the differences, I think someone pointed out that uh, as well, the differences between the regions inside these countries are so big that you really need uh, the specific uh, human resources to become effective. And uh, what the Aga Khan Development Network does is uh, they created this concept of extension technicians, and they uh, give education to one person to the, of the local community, and the, that uh, person will bring that knowledge into the members of the of the local community. Um, then Cedric covered the ge geopolitical issues and the uh, ideological confrontation today. So I'll skip. Uh, I'll skip that. About the concept of spoilers again in Cabo, Del as you mentioned, the example of Nelson Mandela, and next door in Mozambique. What I heard from the ground on the ground is that uh, in Cabo Delgado, one day you are part of the violent extremist group because you need, uh, I don't know, $200 uh, to survive. And the next day you're just a regular member of the society. So definitely the, all the local experts told me not to exclude uh, the, the, the so-called spoilers. I, I think that concept might be even a spoiler itself. Uh, and then um, just also on the on the uh, issue of the large end studies, which I think it's certainly very valuable. 
tool for the researchers, but I, I, I think that now that we are all talking about AI and the chat GPT, I also uh, wonder how AI will easily deliver those results uh, on the large end studies. But what I saw many times is that there is absence of data, but maybe, and this is just a question, is the AI bringing a new era where qualitative studies will be again very re relevant to peace studies? Um, that's one question that I would like to maybe raise. And uh, on Murotani-san's uh, comments, I, oh, having worked in JICA, but mainly as a researcher, I really think JICA is in a good position to uh, connect human security and adaptive peace building. I think uh, this is something that is uh, not explored yet. And uh, it's very interesting maybe for future research to see how these two concepts are uh, inter interlinked. And also, it, uh, you mentioned the challenges from a bureaucracy point of view. And I think uh, we were also mentioning that um, maybe it's good uh, now that you have a research institute that belongs to JICA. And I think I, I'm from Portugal, uh, Lisbon, uh, and also uh, Portugal is a member of the European Union. I don't know many research institutes like this uh, connected with development agencies. So this interaction between uh, practitioners and scholars might result in a, in a very interesting guidebook to cover those issues that uh, you, you mentioned. Now there were, uh, I think, uh, one, specific, one specific question to uh, how the NGOs or the localized NGOs are comp uh, compatible or not uh, with the, the work of JICA. Uh, Mur again, Muratanisa might correct me, but from because I didn't see my data was not uh, it was not the JICA official documents. It was just my questions on the ground. But both the Aga Khan Development Network and the Community Sante Giri told me they told me that they receive support from JICA. That means that uh, uh, JICA values implementation partners uh, like those two examples that I, uh, that I have mentioned. But of course, if, uh, for example, in Cabo Delgado, they also need uh, roads or bridges and uh, some other kinds of projects that uh, maybe those examples that I mentioned uh, the local NGOs cannot have the resources to Im implement as easily as, as JICA. So I think, again, it depends on the context and the type of action, but I think both are com complementary. Um, I think, uh, yes, I think that's all. Okay, thank you very much for your insightful replies in this limited time. Well, uh, in fact, we are already uh, over time, but I'd like to say something. And before that, I'd like to read an online questions uh, from uh, through the through Q&A box. Sustainable peace building is depend upon justice and trust in which the big role of P5 countries to bring ceasefire and armless all the groups for sustainable peace building and bring all of them to the table for talk and make peace by some give and take method and not use veto power to support and justify the group. That is uh, this person's questions and what we have to do to get a peaceful environment because here P5 countries needs to bring justice in their direct in their decisions. So these are the address questions through online. And I'd like to uh, uh, say something for the, all the valuable inputs. And I understand all the questions relate to uh, to Simon Sin Syrian conflict and this conflict case. And uh, as for well, uh, so, and also I'd like to reply as much as possible to the input from Dr. Kubota and Morotani Sam. Well, first, um, I fully agree that. Uh, in case of Syrian conflict, the global context affects a lot to domestic context. But, well, it's 
it, it might be difficult to say uh, the the uh, opposition group could not unite it because of their own interest or because of they are backed by different countries. So it's kind of a chicken and egg uh, discussion, I feel. But however, we could understand that this situation, in fact, uh, uh, made the government uh, government government standpoint more prioritized. I mean, this also contributed to the government dominancy in the conflict. I mean, the ununan ununanimous situation of the opposition group. And this was, unfortunately, this was supported by the different backers in the international community. So I fully agree uh, of all the commentators in this, uh, I mean, all the question here that uh, international and regional uh, dispute uh, affected the local context. And therefore, so that's why I explained that that externally driven approach could not uh, lead the uh, entire peace agreement in the context of Syria. Therefore, uh, as I mentioned, the peace, uh, Syria is still in the peacemaking uh, stage and cannot move on to uh, peace building or post-conflict peace building. So kind of a transitional justice have not been established. Uh, I'm, I'm not familiar so much with the peacekeeping, but in the sense of the traditional uh, step of peace building, I'm afraid the Syrian conflict is still in the peacemaking situation. However, 10 years has passed in peacemaking situation. Therefore, the deterioration of the humanitarian situation, we can see that uh, it is said that the, uh, the biggest crisis in the uh, biggest, one of the biggest crises in humanitarian situation in 21st century. Therefore, and also the Syrian people are quite eager to, to support uh, their people and they don't want to let their country divided. So, in, so you know, it, of course, we need to support the uh, resolve the conflict. However, if it's impossible, then what can we do? Adaptive approach, I feel, derived from such internal, in, uh, such, uh, well, when uh, in, with, in the mind of aid practitioner, uh, adaptive approach could, uh, maybe it's our, our, our wish to support Syrian local people in any kind of assistance with such a deteriorated humanitarian situation, or even kind of, um, if possible, kind of a recovery uh, assistance at the community level, or any kind of potential assistance under the such uh, overwhelming international or regional uh, confrontation among the stakeholders. So therefore, uh, that's the uh, motivation of my chapter to introduce uh, some assistance uh, including the local people's initiative. So I hope uh, this is very kind of a maybe ideal uh, reply, but I hope I could reply to some extent to all the questions. Okay, so I'm very sorry for my bad time management, but I'll, uh, I'll uh, return to uh, the floor to Stiasam. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mtoan, uh, for these questions and uh, answers sessions. Uh, before closing, uh, we would appreciate it if everyone in this seminar uh, could provide your input by filling out the questionnaire. You, uh, for the in-person um, participants, you can find the, the, the programs and the uh, QR code here. Uh, so please fill in uh, before you leave. And then uh, we also have the QR code uh, of the book. You can download from this QR code uh, by free. So, uh, and at last, uh, please leave receivers on the table for in-person uh, participants so that we can collect later on. Uh, once again, thank you uh, for participating in this seminar. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next seminar. Uh, have a nice evening. Thank you. <laughs>